So where are we? Um, the George Inn in Bertham. All about right. to have a nice dinner. <laughs> and then Mike's going to do some photographs for his YouTube channel and his books and things. He's yanking Sussex. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Ah, lovely. <laughs> I am a Yank in Sussex. An unusual amount of time has passed since the posting of my last standard video, which was part two of A Yank in Cornwall. What happened is perhaps worthy of its own video, but I'll just say that part of the delay was due to the holiday we took near Taunton in Somerset, and just a few days after we got there, our car broke down. That holiday was only supposed to last two weeks, but obtaining the needed replacement part took two weeks in itself. We ended up driving rental cars, but had to wait several days for one to become available. So there we were, stuck in Somerset for three weeks. I say stuck in Somerset, but that sounds too negative, as we mostly enjoyed the holiday. It was just that we couldn't leave until the car was fixed. After coming back, I had to resume final work on my book about Bramber Castle, which involved additional research and photography. You may have seen the video announcing the publication of the book. But enough of our problems. Let's go visit Burfham in West Sussex. Where is Burfham? If you happen to be visiting the town of Arundel, with its impressive castle and cathedral, you might find yourself on the castle's east side on the road that leads to South Stoke, a place I've covered in a previous video. Looking northeastwards, you might notice in the distance a rather interesting building. You know where you are, having checked the map. Now reading your compass, you can see that the building is located on a heading of 50 degrees. With the protractor, draw a line from your location, and you see that you're looking at the village of Burfham, and the interesting building is its church. We'll have a closer look at that church a bit later. On the map, Burfham, like the two Stokes, north and south, lies on the River Erin, but not right on the river because it stands on a bluff about 13 meters or 43 feet above the Erin. It's just one and three quarters miles, or 2.8 kilometers, from Arundel as a crow flies. But if you drive there from Arundel, it's three and a quarter miles, or 5.8 kilometers, and takes about 15 minutes. Afternoon traffic on a very nice day, like the one shown here, can be a bit thick. Here we're driving on the A27 until we get to the Crossbush Lane turnoff, and now we're on a country road. Since Burfham is on a bit of a dead end for normal public roads, this is the only way to get there. And you have to leave the same way you came in. On the way, you pass by the small village of Warning Camp and through the hamlet of Wepham. Wepham is actually part of the same civil parish as Burfham, and they're very close to one another. It might be worth pointing out that there is one more Burfham in England, and that one is located in Surrey and is a suburb of Guildford. As my viewers may have noticed, I like to find out the meanings or origins of the names of the places I visit, and I'll start with Warning Camp. It's not a part of Burfham Civil Parish, but it's on the way, and the name is interesting, so I'm covering it. Question. Was it a camp set up to warn of danger or approaching enemies? Sounds plausible, doesn't it? But this turns out to be what is called a folk etymology, meaning a deduction of a name that is based on a false assumption, but not on evidence. The University of Nottingham's Survey of English Place Names has this to say, quote, The name was originally Vernenkamp, meaning Verna's field. Who was Verna? Nobody knows. Whoever he was, his camp or field today has about 156 people living in it. Wepham's place name also refers to an old inhabitant. It comes from Wepa's Ham, or Wepa's Hamlet or Village. On the other hand, the name Burfham doesn't come from anyone's name, but for its original function. Just so there's no question, by the way, I have been pronouncing it correctly, Burfham. Just to be absolutely certain, I checked with one of the workers in the village pub, the George, to make sure it wasn't pronounced Burpham. 
as you may be aware, place names in the United Kingdom can be a minefield of unexpectedness, even for natives. Burfham's name comes from its use as the site of an old Saxon burgh, or fort. The fort seems not to have been given an actual name, so the village that grew up around its entrance took its name from the word corresponding to fort. Originally, the name would have been pronounced something like Burgham, meaning fort village or village of the fort. And as these things do, over the course of the centuries, the pronunciation wore down to today's Burfham. The fort is a striking example of a promontory fort. It occupies the whole of a narrow tongue of land jutting out southward from the downs into the water meadows of the Aran. Its extreme length is 760 yards, or 695 meters. At its northern end, it's 953 feet, or 290 meters wide, rapidly narrowing down to no more than 200 feet, or 63 meters, and then it gradually expands again to 450 feet, or 137 meters wide in the lower half. The area is seemingly level, but the eastern edge and the southern end fall slightly towards a small stream, which descends from the northeast to the River Aran. The sole artificial defense is the gigantic earthen vallum or wall with exterior trench that crosses the neck of the peninsula with an entrance at the middle. The vallum forms an obtuse angle at the entrance. The eastward section runs some little way down the slope towards the stream. The westward section ends abruptly upon a scarp which comprises most of the defense of the camp on the remaining sides. This scarp is easily visible from the ground. Part of the western side nearest the river does form a definite cliff. The vallum is extremely steep and is 36 feet tall at the center, and at ground level its base is 75 feet wide. The outer slope falls more deeply into a shallow trench that's now occupied by buildings and gardens. Most of the interior of the fort is used for cattle grazing, but on the northwest there's a village green which contains a cricket pitch and a children's play area. The village hall is near the entrance to the fort, and there's a parking lot. The village probably did not exist as a habitation before Alfred the Great, the King of Wessex, had a burgh or fortification constructed at the location. Burfham's fort was one of 33 that were constructed under the orders of Alfred after his victory over the Danes at the Battle of Eddington in 878 AD. This system of fortified towns or forts, shown here on the map, were built in response to the continuing Viking threat. These forts included former Roman towns, where stone walls were repaired and perimeter ditches sometimes added, temporary forts, and substantial new towns. Whereas the village did not exist when Alfred had the fort built, it's worth pointing out that the locality was not uninhabited. Documents from 711 AD mention nearby Peppering Farm, then called Peepering Farm. This was about 170 years before the fort was built. Plans to build the village hall in 1973 sparked a project to carry out a limited archaeological excavation in 1972 on the site of the soon-to-be-built hall. The excavation team discovered evidence consisting mainly of post holes for two buildings of Saxon origin. In the next year, while a crew was digging a trench for the construction of a drainage system, it was possible for an archaeological team to examine the profile of the subsurface structure. They discovered evidence for a deep ditch of about the same width as the earthen wall external to the wall. They also found pit and post holes, the function of which they were unsure. The earthen vallum was not excavated on either occasion, so the researchers were unable to say whether it was originally erected by King Alfred's engineers or if it was already in existence by that time and simply reused by them. The method of the wall's construction suggests it's most likely to have been built by Iron Age or Celtic people. The Romans were not known for this kind of construction, and neither were the Saxons, though both did sometimes reuse existing ancient earthworks. Besides the obvious promontory fort, other relics of the past have been found in the immediate area. In 1820, not far from Peppering Farm, the bones, a tusk, and some grinding teeth of an elephant were found just below the surface. In 1842 and 1858, ancient wooden dugout boats were discovered in the mud next to the River Aran near Burfham. These boats were rather long, on the order of 13 to 20 feet long, made from thick oak trunks, and were clearly of great age. Just north of Peppering Farm, there was a squarish moated site surrounded by an earthen berm. 
In one old book I found, Waters of Erin by A. Hadrian Alcroft, it's referred to as Green Garden for some reason. Perhaps it had a garden in it by tradition. Besides the village of Burfham, I want to acknowledge its hamlet, Wepham. They're separated from each other only by a slight valley with a small streamlet, and for practical purposes they're pretty much the same village. From the map or from the satellite view, they appear to be similarly sized, with Burfham having a slight advantage. Most of Burfham's homes are found along its main street, which, like many such small villages, is called simply the street, although the part of that street passing by the church is called Main Street. Wepham's Main Street is called Wepham Ford on the map. The Ford part of the street name seems to mean that the stream fills the road at times, and vehicles must then drive through its water. As you can see as we're driving down the street, there are quite a number of lovely old homes of many different styles and a fair number of thatch roofs. Burfham is at the end of a long road which clings to the eastern side of the River Aran Valley and then stops, meaning there is no through traffic, as I said before. As many walking guides indicate, Burfham is the gateway to enjoyable walking around some of the more remote countryside in southeast England. The parish church is dedicated to St. Mary the Virgin, and its construction definitely goes back into Saxon times, though clearly not earlier than 880 AD after the fort was established by King Alfred. According to one source, I found the site of the church previously featured both a Celtic burial mound and some Roman archaeological remains. In any case, there has been a church on this site since as far back as the late 800s, meaning there has been one here for at least the last 1,100 years. The church in its present form is somewhat younger, however. By the early 1800s AD, like many rural churches of the era, it had decayed a good deal and was in need of a lot of repair and improvement. This finally came to an end with the arrival of a new parish priest, Rev. Robert Foster, in 1845. He began a program of repairs and improvement which put this church back on the road to recovery. One unusual feature of this church is what it looks like from above. Most Sussex village churches are simple rectangles in plan, with cross shapes pretty much restricted to large town and city churches. But from the air, you can see that St. Mary's is a very charming exception. It's cruciform. Inside, thanks to the efforts of Rev. Foster and his concerned parishioners of the day, the church is quite beautiful and well suited to its task of raising the spirituality of the people to a high level. Practically every bit of structure and accoutrement is of great age and elegance. For example, these, be these bench ends date from the 1400s. The baptismal font is likewise of the 1400s. The candelabra dates from the 1600s, and elements of both Saxon and Norman construction can be found throughout, as well as some elements that are more modern. We had made a day out to visit Burfham, mainly for me to get more photos and videos. I was there in the previous year, but needed more. But we were there partly to have a nice meal at Burfham's pub, the George. We got there early enough that we were one of the first to arrive for the afternoon, but by the time we were done, the place was a poppin'. And no wonder, because the food was absolutely excellent, and so was the service. We highly recommend it, and will definitely be returning. The George is a 17th century grade 2 listed pub and restaurant. It used to be called the George and Dragon, but possibly the Dragon ran away somewhere. Never mind, the food is what counts. I had the home-pressed cheeseburger and was very impressed with it. While the pub itself is owned by the community since 2006, it's leased and managed by a husband and wife team, Martin and Charlotte Bull. It was in 2023 that the pub was awarded its first AA Rosette and featured in the AA 2023 Pick of the Pubs Guide. The AA Rosette is an award recognizing culinary excellence in the United Kingdom and Ireland and is awarded by the AA, also known as the Automobile Association. We were really impressed by this lovely little village. My British bride told me that she had always wanted to visit Burfham, but until I brought her here, she hadn't yet done so. It has the advantage of being well off the beaten trail, but at the same time being not at all far from larger towns with all their amenities. As I've noted, you can see Arundel and its castle from the village green, and it's a short drive to get there. One thing I'd like to see happen is a modern effort to better establish the archaeology of the place. There is probably plenty of interesting finds just waiting to be found in the fort, for one thing. For another, it would be really nifty if the origins of that very tall vallum could be determined. 
as a member of the Royal Archaeological Society, I will be suggesting that they put that on their to-do list. This has been a production of A Yank in Sussex. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe or follow. Thanks for watching, and may you have a very nice day.